Uh, yeah, tough, uh, tough act to follow there, but um, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different today. So yesterday I was walking around Berlin and I noticed this enormous poster. Um, I was walking around with my wife, uh, Fan, who's with us today as well, and I decided I'll walk towards it because I noticed there was some lines across the person's face here, and I, on closer inspection I noticed that it was computer code, uh, it was syntax highlighted computer code, and it was jQuery, because I saw um, the remove method and the CSS method. And my talk is about writing less code, because I think it's gone too far now. I think when it gets to the stage that we're laser engraving jQuery on people's screaming, agonized faces, and then boasting about it by getting that printed up in a big photo and um, plastering it all over Berlin, someone needs to say something. And so that's what I'm going to do today. So most technical talks that you'll hear about how to write code, my technical talk is about how not to write code. But I don't mean how to write code badly, because that's sort of an ambiguous expression, although I could talk about that whole fucking day. I have a lot of experience in how to write code badly. No, it's about how to avoid writing code altogether, because there's too much of it already, and most of it is shit. So it's loosely based on an article I wrote uh, a little while ago called On Writing Less Damn Code. And because that was an article that was um, published on the web, what I did is I did some performance there, and I removed the ED at the end of damned. I said it was two less bytes that I was putting over the wire, because that's how much I care about performance. Both arguably grammatically correct, so it was OK. Um, it was a big hit on Reddit. Um, Oswaldo uh, has commented, seriously, write less damn article. Uh, the article was uh, just under 1,000 words, which is a lot, uh, a lot of stuff to get through. Quite a challenge to read if you learn to read by browsing Reddit. But the principle remains the same. Uh, less of anything is good. And if there's less of anything, then there's less shit stuff as well. And uh, you get simplicity. So if you don't give yourself very much code, then uh, if you budget yourself to having a small amount of code, then you don't uh, end up producing that much stuff. So you, you're forced to focus on the things which are important, the things which people actually want. So you end up with a simpler interface which more people can use. And naturally, you get performance as well, because um, there's less uh, code to execute. There's less code to actually send to the client. There are some fringe benefits, too, for developers. If you're a web developer and you're writing not code, you're, you're, you're not writing code at all, then you can leave out comments because there's nothing to comment. And you, uh, there's no technical debt um, because, well, for obvious reasons. And you can use a combination of tabs and spaces <laughs> because uh, Everything is white space surrounding the point in time and space at which your application doesn't exist. And to be perfectly clear, I'm not talking here about perceived performance. I'm talking about doing, actually doing less code, actually not doing as much. So instead of sending the stuff that the user actually needs first, and then secretly sending loads of extraneous shit that they don't need uh, behind their back and fucking their data contract, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, ideally, what you should do is not start at all. Don't do any coding. Don't even start the project. Someone says, I've got a great idea for a project. Say, fuck, no, I'm not doing any more of that. Uh, and then you don't have to tell them about it. So you don't have to make the modal which says, hey, we've made this app. So for instance, uh, you might have a web application already which serves lots of people because as Tim was talking about, the great thing about the web is it's, it should be universal, it should reach everyone. Then you make the decision that why don't we do the same thing but do it on iOS using Xcode or some shit like that. Don't fucking bother. Then you don't have to do the modal to tell them about it so you don't have to code a modal so you can get rid of that as well. So perfect. And you're sort of doing your good deed for the day then as well because um, if you're not using that modal, then that's another modal which is in the common pot which someone else can take. And uh, Twitter's interface is made entirely out of modals, so you're sort of doing a favor for them. So they can take your modal that you would have used and add another modal to their web interface. So doing a good deed. Um, so already we're on a roll. We've destroyed one entire native application. We've decided not to code that whatsoever. And therefore, we don't have to do the modal and make the modal accessible and make the modal 
responsive and all of that stuff. But it's easy to sort of forget yourself. You think, well, I've budgeted and I've done very little, uh, so great. Um, but then you think, well, in that case, I've still got more budget. I'll do something else. Um, for instance, in this talk, I've got this picture of Rick Astley, um, which is totally unnecessary. There's no point that being there at all. It's a 200-year-old meme. It's not funny. It was never funny. The Rick Rolling thing, it wasn't funny. And it's 936 kilobytes. I found that GIF on the internet, and it's 936 kilobytes. You should be able to make free entire working web applications for that amount of code. So fuck that as well. We can get rid of that. Right, now, carousels. <laughs> I was bound to talk about carousels at some point, so I'm going to talk about carousels next. This is what a carousel vaguely looks like. And when you build a carousel, you have to ask yourself lots of important questions, don't you? So for instance, you have to ask yourself, how do I support touch? So if it's on a touch interface, how do I do, do it so it does that thing where I can flick, but it will sort of stick so it, it shows the whole picture. And then when I flick again, it, it sort of locks into position, right? So you ask yourself questions like that. You also ask yourself questions like, what should be the accessible name for the uh, handles on either side? So should it be uh, previous, or should it be back? Or, and how, how should you actually put that label in there? Should it be an area label attribute, or should it be a, a span with a special class, which means it's visually hidden, but not hidden to screen readers? Uh, and what the fuck are those things even called? Are they pips? I don't know. Pips or something like that. Uh, they're all the wrong questions, actually. I was sort of leading you up the garden path there. Uh, you shouldn't be asking any of those questions. The only question you should be asking is, how do I get off coding this thing that everybody hates? And all of the uh, research that has been done, all of the anecdotal data and everything, points to the fact that everyone either hates carousels or doesn't know how to use them or doesn't want to use them or prefers to use something else. Which brings me to unprogressive non-enhancement which is a new concept that I've come up with. Unprogressive non-enhancement is where you take some structured content which follows the vertical flow of the document in a time-honored fashion, in a way that everyone understands, which people can traverse easily by either dragging their scroll bar with their mouse or operating the keyboard using the up and down keys or using the space bar, or if they're using a touch device, simply flicking backwards and forwards in that easy way that we've all become used to. And what you do is you take that and you fucking well leave it alone. You don't do anything else. You don't turn it into a carousel. So that's unprogressive normal enhancement. Ideally, you wouldn't be asking any questions. You wouldn't have even started with any of that kind of stuff. Because as soon as someone said the word carousel in a meeting or in your office or any time at all that you were on, on the job, um, what you do is you, you drop to the floor like this. <laughs> and uh, you, you simply roll out of the, uh, out of the uh, room like that. So don't engage, basically. Don't entertain the idea. So, social media buttons is another classic one. Uh, I wrote this blog post a little while ago. Look at this shitty tweet button. Uh, that's the entire blog post. I've not abridged that. Um, uh, which is great for people who uh, are Redditors, of course, because that means they're able to read it they, without falling asleep or farting or dying or whatever they do when they run out of um, the ability to read stuff. Um, it did confuse a few people who came to my blog. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Doe weighs in with, what? Thank you, Johnny. Um, but the point of it was to say, that is just simply a button which has tweets written on it. And all it does is uh, use an endpoint in Twitter's API, which pre-fills a tweet, and then you, you can then tweet something. And this is the amount of code that it's made of. And it doesn't actually fit on the screen. It goes about there, like that. That's um, a bit of JavaScript which pulls in an iframe, which contains JavaScript, CSS, and um, HTML. And I spent some time trying to find the bit that actually did the thing that I wanted it to do. And I've highlighted it here. The rest of it is absolutely extraneous. Uh, and you can see that the Twitter engineers have done some really good, um, what I call uh, perf here. What they've done is they've used this highly um, optimized and fast uh, attribute, the ID, and they've only used just one character in those um, IDs, so that the uh, JavaScript runs really fast, and they're not using many characters at all. And that's what I call perf, taking a fundamentally stupid, fuckwitted idea and doing superficial and uh, unhelpful enhancements just to convince yourself that you care about performance. So. Some of you may have noticed, if you're uh, the eagle-eyed among you, that I already have a link 
which does exactly the same thing on all of my blog posts anyway. Um, and that uses only this amount of code. And again, as I said, it just uses the API, and it's just a couple of uh, query parameters for the text that you want to appear in the tweet preloaded and the URL to link, obviously, to the resource. A tiny, tiny amount of code. But does anyone actually use it? Do they fuck? No. So get rid of both. Get rid of the tweet button and get rid of that. I haven't got rid of that yet. I've, I've left it. I'm lazy. I don't update my blog design. But I should be getting rid of that, too. Uh, as a sort of side point, recently there was a competition called um, 10K Apart, which was organized by the Alist Apart people. I was a judge. And the idea was that you had to try to make a working web application with just 10K. Uh, and someone did a fantastic thing. It was, it was remarkable that it was done with so little code. And then they decided it would be a good idea in their entry, because we have to judge all these, obviously, independently, to include a tweet button. So he took his 10K application, which did all of that stuff, and added a tweet button so that people could share it. We weren't going to share it, because this was, <laughs> this was a, a closed judging uh, uh, circumstance anyway, and made it 50K. So the decision for me as a judge was fairly easy. So I disqualified that. But it's a shame. And so th I guess the serious point here is just because you didn't write the code and you're just using someone else's, that doesn't mean it doesn't appear uh, on the user's client, right? So, oh, well, I only wrote 10K. The other stuff was someone else's bother. Uh, yeah, I, that doesn't really uh, work. Um, so I'm an accessibility um, engineer and, and advocate or whatever. So I talk a bit about um, ARIA. And did you know, though, about ARIA that it's actually not a real specification? The first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA, uh, which is kind of weird, isn't it, if you think about it, that ARIA as a specification is just saying, it's like they've spent years working on this, and it's a very noble cause as well to try and make the web more accessible, and they've spent ages on all of these lists discussing how to make all of these attributes and everything work together, and they're basically at the end of it or at the start of the specification just say, by the way, everything else in this is just a joke. If you use it, then you're going to look pretty, pretty daft. But that's not quite what they mean. What they mean is don't use it unless you have to. So let's look at a few examples. Don't do this. This is just ridiculous. You've got a div, you've got an ARIA role of heading, and then a, a property of ARIA level 2. Uh, and that's just the same as that in terms of interoperability, in terms of how it would work in a screen reader. So just use that because it's less code. Same with this. If you have a div with a roll of button and a tab index of 0, that makes it keyboard accessible, and it will, when you um, focus it, it will announce to screen readers, this is a button. Great. But also, you've actually got to write some JavaScript, which I haven't included here, to actually make enter and space key presses work. So that's a hell of a lot of code when using that would do all of it for you. This is a list, which you could just make out of list items. And this one I saw on a project the other day. Someone has tried to reinvent the image tag using a div. So there's a div, the class of image, presumably the class of image uh, is to give it some sort of basic image styling. Then an ARIA label of picture of cat, because you can't use an alt attribute on a div, so there has to be another labeling mechanism. Style, uh, an inline style attribute of background image URL, and then the image there like that. And what you really should be doing is that instead. Why were they doing this? Because they could. Should they? Fuck no, they shouldn't. Right. ARIA isn't for making HTML accessible. It's for making inaccessible HTML accessible. That's a sort of a good rule. So it's for sort of patching shit HTML, which had already been done badly. Um, if you get, ar um, if you get um, accessibility thinking into the design process, obviously that shouldn't happen. Um, but yeah, it's for patching stuff for the most part. But there are a few things that you can do with ARIA that you can't do with um, basic HTML5. One is states. So ARIA expanded, which takes a value of true or false, should say, um, should tell the user whether or not the thing that the button is controlling is available or unavailable, open or closed. Um, but the thing is, you don't actually have to use the button role just because you're using the state property. So you can just use a button, which has an implicit role. So the button has a button role without you having to write it, I guess. Um, and then just use ARIA expanded with it. Complex relationships like. Um, a good example is ARIA described by um, is a good way of connecting up um, hints for form elements. So you have a bit of like a paragraph um, with an ID 
which says, oh, you need to fill this in in a certain way, and you connect it up to the, um, to the input using area described by, which has a value of the ID. And that way, when the user focuses the input, it will read the description. It will append that to the other information that's there. Um, if you just put a paragraph in the form, you'll never get that information, because uh, you're browsing by focus. You won't actually uh, move to, to, the, uh, to the paragraph directly. And live regions, of course, which are really cool. They're like an ARL mes uh, messaging system. So you would end up um, uh, filling out some information in the live region, which would say, um, oh, you've made this error, or whatever. And just by populating the live region, it gets announced in screen reader technology. Otherwise, they wouldn't know that that was happening, because it would just be visually appearing somewhere on the screen. So there's stuff that you can sort of progressively enhance into HTML, but just don't use ARIA where it's not needed. So text resizing. Who has seen a website which has something like this on it? Yeah. And some of them look a bit like that. Or if you're really ambitious and you've done a lot of cocaine, <laughs> you might do that. <laughs> uh, there is no need to do any of that. All you're doing is sending redundant code to the client. It's just more code, more JavaScript, or whatever. You might have to pull in jQuery just to do that on a perfectly normal textual site. Um, because users already have things like Command Plus or Control Plus to zoom. And they can also change the text settings in their browser. It's a really important thing to remember is that the, the outer bit around your interface is also an interface. The browser Chrome is an interface. Really, actually, your interface is a sort of pseudo interface. It's just content, which has interactivity. But the great thing about deferring to changing the text size there is that it will be in the same fucking place whatever website they're visiting. Because it's part of the browser, not, I mean, like anyone's going to be interested in learning your particular take on a text resizing widget every time they go to a different website. They're not. Um, but there's, some people will protest and go, but what if some users don't know that those features are there? And I would um, reply that, well, they could Google it. They could try and find out that way and type in resize text in Firefox. Oh, that's how you do it. Now, not everyone knows how to do that. And, uh, and Tim was talking about this before in terms of um, the technical literacy of some people. We take, we take for granted that people would know how to use things, but often they don't. But the point is, if they don't know how to do that, you putting a custom text resizing widget on a site is not going to fucking help them. Right. So if you want to support the vision impaired, what you do is you just make sure that the, um, what they change in the browser actually gets honored. So you don't suppress the features that are already there. You don't add your own features, because that's just more redundant code. You don't suppress the features that are already there. So you use uh, relative units for things. So you use M and rem, et cetera, because despite the fact that most users will do full page zoom, which doesn't, that will work using pixel units. But um, browsers still have the option of resizing things um, uh, in the settings, so you can resize the body text. And that will only resize the body text. So if your body text is resized, uh, is in M's, but your line height is in pixels, everything's going to go fucky, basically. So everything should be in relative units. Don't put that in there. That's a really good example of doing less, but giving a better user experience. If you just take user scalable equals no out of your viewport meta uh, tag, then everything is just better for your user. So just take that away, less code, better product. Um, and also avoid fixed and absolute positioning wherever you can. Because as soon as someone starts pinch zooming and things are kind of fixed in a particular place, everything's going to start getting obscured. Things are going to overlap in a horrible way. So just try and just go with the flow, as it were, and use static positioning wherever you can. So if someone approaches you and says, oh, we should have a text resizing widget to help people with low vision, say, well, that's cute. That's nice. I'm glad that you're thinking about people like that. But um, actually, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going <laughs> to roll out and leave. So right. OK, I need a drink before this one. Mm. <laughs> OK. Device breakpoints. Has anyone heard of device breakpoints like versus content breakpoints? in terms of responsive design. So there are different ways of approaching it. Now, I'm figuring that most of you don't fall for this trap. But what happened was a little while ago, say a little while ago, about a year ago, I saw this tweet that someone did, and it was a picture of all of the dimensions of a load of um, iOS, like Apple devices. And they'd written, 
all the viewports available on iOS 9 for responsive web design. And me being a dick, wrote, uh, like quoted them, did the dick thing of quoting them and said, I don't think that's how responsive web design works. Because I don't think it, I mean, first of all, because not everyone has an Apple device, but also like the idea that just when a new like device comes out, then responsive design changes, it doesn't. Um, so I said that and they replied and they said, ideally I agree, but a key for a successful mobile experience is to understand the real world. <laughs> uh, so what he's saying there is he's saying, because you don't exist in the real world, like actually you're a figment of my imagination, therefore I'm right. <laughs> um, what am I, like fucking Roger Rabbit or something like that? <laughs> like I'm superimposed in some cinematic um, sort of fashion. But in any case, this seems to be how a lot of people do responsive design. They go, okay, what we've got is we've got your MacBook Pros, you've got your iPads, and you've got your iPhones. So we'll do a breakpoint for each, and then it's responsive. Brilliant. We're sorted. Great. Good work, Brad. Good work, Scott and Hunter, or the bro names. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've, we're sorted. Great. We've done a great job. Everyone's covered. Everyone's fine. No one's going to have a broken experience because we've, because they're the only things on the market, right? Um, and let's, so let's settle down and let's just watch the Apple keynote, shall we? Uh, and and see what they have to say. Oh fuck. Oh okay. So now now there's four devices. There's, so right. Okay. Right. What we're going to do? Okay. So all of our current apps and all of our old apps and everything we've made so far was only designed to work on those three. Now we've got this fourth one to cover. We're going to have to pull a lot of uh, late nighters. So uh, Brad, if you could get some cocaine, like a lot of, a lot of cocaine, this is going to take months. Um, and uh, we'll pull a few all night. Get out the MacBook Pro um, um, Jeb or whatever your name is. And... We, go, we need to cover this other device, because what's happened here is the responsive landscape has changed. It's a paradigm shift, isn't it? The tectonic plates have gone fucky. <laughs> so, <laughs> that takes about six months to cover that. So, like, whoo, okay, right. <laughs> that was quite a lot of coke. It's very Moorish coke. Uh, <clears throat> let's settle down and watch the Apple keynote. <clears throat> So, Timmy C, again, he's, he's, yeah, okay. So now we've got, we've got this other iPhone, which is slightly, slightly different size. Um, Brad, yeah, I think that, that's probably enough Coke for this. <laughs> if you go get the Coke and uh, uh, I'll get a pizza and the coffee, you know, the gourmet coffee and all of that and the beach balls or whatever people have in these offices. Uh, we'll sort this out. Right, okay. That takes another six months or thereabouts, about time for another Apple keynote, probably. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> You're killing me, Tim Tim. You're killing me. What the fuck is that? <laughs> it's like loads of people had lead poisoning and suddenly think they're in the Jetsons, for fuck's sake, right. So then you've got design. I mean, I've never designed a responsive site for a watch. I mean, who's going to read like a blog post on a watch? Uh, but yeah, in any case, like I, as I said, I think probably you all get this already. You get the fact that this is it's it's, it's a daft way about going going about doing responsive design. You should think about it so that um, you only really have to change things where the content comes under pressure. So as you, you as you uh, narrow the viewport. Um, if something sort of wraps in a way that you don't like, you put in a breakpoint and you fix that, and then you're covering all of the Apple devices and all of the other devices. It takes less code. You're actually writing less code because you're not, you're not sort of um, being heavy-handed and saying, okay, this device, this device, this device, and you're covering a lot more. So that's good. But you can also actually, um, some of the other stuff that you're doing in your responsive design, say in terms of scaling the font size and that sort of stuff, you can do that too. Um, uh, you can automate that. So you can use viewport width uh, units. So uh, the problem with viewport width units is that um, they don't scale. So they're not accessible on their own. But what you can do is you can enter them in, uh, in an equation with an M using the calc function. Uh, 
So what you then get is everything's going to be 1m or more, uh, depending on the width of the viewport, right? So it kind of works like this. And because 1m plus naught viewport width is still 1m, you actually have a minimum font size. A lot of people have muted the idea of having a min font size property in CSS. You kind of don't need it because you can do this. Now, you don't have to do that thing where you have the breakpoint and go, well, at this breakpoint, I'm going to have my h2 at 38 pixels and my p at uh, 12 pixels or whatever. You don't have to think about it because it just does it for you. So you save a lot more code that way too. Right. Now, grids. OK, so the thing with grids, I've noticed, is that if you plot the number of columns of a, of a website, and I mean <laughs> the columns of the whole page, against the likelihood that it's a shit show, it's sort of, you know, like that. Um, that's, that's only a correlation. I'm not saying that it's causative. Sometimes you have sites which have multiple columns, and they're fine. But generally, you just, it's, it's worse. Um, there's nothing wrong with this kind of layout. That's a one-column layout. You've got your logo at the top. You've got your navigation. You've got the main content. You've got a max width to make sure that uh, uh, the line lengths don't get too long so you don't, people don't have trouble le reading. Uh, you've got your footer at the bottom. It doesn't have to be exactly like that. You can do this. Do full width for the navigation because you don't have to worry about measure there because it's individual compartments. Big footer or a smaller footer, whatever. Move the logo up there. Have that as your home link as well. Saves on redundancy, pulls the main content further up. Things start to go to shit when you do this. And the reason is you've got this big space here which does nothing, and that only gets worse when you start to scroll and everything's just lopsided. You can fix that by doing this, making sure that you have exactly the number of pages needed to fill up the whole viewport, <laughs> going vertically. And that'll only work for that viewport height as well, obviously. Uh, and then uh, you have to use position fixed, of course, then, so that when you scroll, that stays where it is. Yeah. Uh, trouble then is if you do add another page uh, so that you get another item in the navigation, no one will ever see it because um, position fixed, meaning that you can't scroll it into view. So you have to make that scrollable. Uh, and it, can you see how it's going to fuck already? Just by add, and that's just two columns that you're adding to the. Uh, um, but most of the time, you don't have enough navigation items in the first place. A simple site with a decent information architecture shouldn't have that many links one after the other. And that's why we invented things like this to fill the gaps. <laughs> and this, where you pull in a whole other fucking website and put it in an iframe and stick it in there. So with just two columns, things have gone wrong, because that's not how the web was designed. Like I said before, the bit in the middle of the browser is for the content. It should be like books don't have multiple columns. Word documents don't have like a little bit on the side, and then everything skewed off to the side. You know? And also, you've, when you go down to like a mobile uh, sort of width, you can only afford to have one column anyway. And you've got to maintain that layout and make sure that the UX for that layout still works. So what's the point in going that way? Jerry uh, Jones disagrees with me. He says, I love sites with multi-column layouts. It makes it obvious which content I should not. And that is true. I get that. So if you've got three columns, then you go, well, that's obviously some adverts and shit. That's like asking me to go on fuckbook or whatever. And then you go, and you know, it's sort of everything points towards the middle. So I, I get what he's saying. But um, I disagree. I think we should start mobile first and just stay there. Just don't, like, one column is fine, as long as you've got a max width there to make sure that the lines don't go out too far then you're OK. Uh, so as you may have guessed, I'm not big on grid systems, like these big dependencies we, uh, we bring in, just to make layouts, which we've decided are actually shit anyway. Uh, but putting things next to things is OK. I approve of that. Um, so for instance, you might have like product teasers um, or th uh, thumbnails in an image gallery, that kind of thing. Why not do that? That's a good idea. Pulling it all up together and, and uh, making a bit of a grid of that content is absolutely fine. And it turns out you can do that in all cases with this tiny amount of code. You don't need a grid system or whatever. You can just use Flexbox, use a margin and a negative margin for the gutters. And you use what's a kind of a um, container query, which is the flex um, basis property, which is the last 
argument here on flex 10m. And now what that means is that each item will be around 10m if, uh, if they can fit to be 10m. So it will, it will actually grow because you've got flex grow set to 1. So everything sort of basically uh, fixes around the 10m measure. Um, and everything just collapses and folds together as expected like this. You don't need any breakpoints whatsoever. You just let it do its stuff. That's all the code you need. Just to be a bit of a troll, I turned that into a framework. Oh, I should just mention that it's also progressive enhancement because if DisplayFlex isn't recognized, and it is recognized in most browsers, if DisplayFlex isn't recognized, then everything just goes back to being in one column as if everything was display block rather than display flex. Um, but yeah, I made a framework called Fuckle, um, which is based on, on this, as the distinctive logo, which looks like a sea anemone, as you can see. Um, it's 93 bytes minified, which means it fits in a tweet. That was before... <laughs> Thank you. That's actually before I refactored it. It's smaller than that now. Because um, I'm using some redundant properties in there. Someone else pointed that out. Um, dependency management. I started off just saying, well, I just put it in the readme file in the, in the repo and just said copy and paste it. I'm not doing bar and stuff like that. And then foolishly, I said, if it gets 1,000 stars on GitHub, I'll put it on Bower. So now it's on Bower. So you can install it on Bower if you want to. Um, <laughs> or... Or, as Hugo pointed out, there is actually a node module which allows you to require from Twitter. So you could just put in the ID of the tweet that I wrote back here, and you can just install it from Twitter into your dependency stream. So there you go. Now, uh, one final one is single page applications. And um, Alex Russell recently has been doing some uh, great stuff. Um, when I say great stuff, he's been doing some some incredible rants on Twitter. I don't know if you've read any of them, and I've been sort of nodding my head violently going, oh yeah, this is brilliant. And one of the concepts he's come up with is the idea of a zero budget. So the idea is you don't start with a framework, because a framework comes with loads of stuff um, which you don't need. And the only way you can compete with the performance and native is to actually just code the stuff that you need. Um, so single page applications, uh, there's not actually a lot that makes them single-page applications. Angular allows for you to do single-page application type stuff, but it comes with loads of other stuff. And the API is actually 1.2 megabytes. What you can do if you're making a very simple single-page application is just use things like this. This target pseudo class is a really, really interesting and important thing. And it's a CSS thing, obviously. And what it is is it's a cipher that mediates between the uh, hash fragment in the URL and an ID for a piece of content in the page. So if you write this CSS here, where you have uh, a set of views, uh, which have the class view, and then you use the pseudo class um, of target on just one, what you can get is this kind of effect, where you click the link, and because it's then going to that hash fragment and it's loading it in the URL, it's like loading views in the way that views are managed entirely with JavaScript in something like Angular or that kind of thing. So you can get what's fundamentally, I think, what kind of makes a single page application single page application-y without even JavaScript, which is kind of cool. And Uno's got a really cool page here as well, which is about lots of things that you can do uh, without JavaScript. And I think the the... It's always very controversial to talk about the progressive enhancement and whether things should have JavaScript or not. I think there's lots of things which do need JavaScript, but uh, we use JavaScript for things that we don't need to use JavaScript for, and it's necessarily less robust and necessarily less performant where we do. If you're just using standard browser behavior, then you're going to get something which is a lot more robust and a lot more uh, uh, performant. Um, but, of course, I'm aware that you're going to have to use some JavaScript in a single page application. And as it happens, the on hash change event is really handy. And it's just a standard um, event uh, that's supported pretty well universally. And you can just use that to um, fire an event every time the hash changes in the, uh, in the URL. And it also even has a property of old URL, 
which is a standard part of that um, web API technology, um, which uh, points to the previous hash fragment that you're at. So you can manage all the history and stuff like that really easily. And then you don't get any back button woes whatsoever. So you just click the back button, that changes the URL, that fires the event, your single page application is doing everything you want. And the stuff that you hang off that on a hash change event can be whatever. You can render stuff using um, uh, templating, or you can change some of the content, or do, a, uh, do an XHR request, or whatever. But it's really pared down, and it's the basic skeleton of a single page application without all of the other extraneous crap. So who's heard this expression, less is more? Okay, okay. So when I was researching this talk, I, um, I got the expression and I looked it up uh, in Google image search, and you get all of this sort of, um, these sort of inspirational posters about it, like this one, less is more. And what they've done here is a visual metaphor. I don't know if you can see this, but what they've done is they've made more, sort of like more by making it bold. So to sort of ram the point home, uh, it's another one here, and I think this one's funny because there couldn't be a more complex way <laughs> of representing less is more. And they haven't even got is there. They've had to go for equals because otherwise it would have been unreadable. So that was a bit unfortunate. And my all-time favorite, this one, <laughs> because it's really on the nose, because <laughs> it says design inspiration at the top. So it's like, less is more, what the fuck are you talking about? It's design inspiration. Ah, clever, right, I see where you're going. And I think actually in this case, by less is more, what they meant is less contrast. So, brilliant. <laughs> Um, now, there's something about the less is more uh, principle, or whatever you want to call it, that bothered me. I, it sounded off, so I did a bit of research, and I looked up the word less, and it says a smaller amount of, or not as much. And I thought, that doesn't sound like more to me, that actually sounds like less. <laughs> so, <laughs> the next thing I did, to follow up on that piece of investigation was to look up the word more. <clears throat> and uh, that says a greater or additional amount of, or degree. And I thought, that's weird, because that sounds like more, not less, as the inspirational designers would have you believe. So then, to double check, I went back to less, and I noticed this here, an antonym. For those of you um, who uh, don't know what an antonym is, it means opposite word. It means a thing which is the opposite of. So instead of less being more, being actually being like more, what they're saying is it's actually totally different. It's completely the different, uh, a different thing. And I thought, fuck, right. So I, I thought, right, I've stumbled upon something here which is like monumental and I really need to like, oh, no, I need to tell everyone about this. But I couldn't rely on the anecdotal evidence of uh, dictionaries, because that would be flimsy. So what I did is I, um, I decided to use a scientific approach. And I used the greatest mechanism known to man for determining what is true or false. And it's, that's called JavaScript. So I put JavaScript <laughs> into my console and wrote less equals equals more like that. and it came out as false. So all of those fucking designers, <laughs> there was bullshit. They wouldn't know a boolean if it hit them in the face. Um, as it turns out, <laughs> less is actually less. I don't know that's a tautology, a sort of stating the obvious, but less is less. And that's actually a good thing, because if you has, have less of anything, then you necessarily have less weight, less complexity, less distraction, less bother, and less bullshit. And let's face it, I think we could do with less talking, so I'm going to shut the fuck up now. <laughs> Thank you very much.